So Silvia Federici is a, a, an Italian um, sociologist and uh, philosopher. She's a more or less naturalized also American, but let's say nevertheless, she's Italian coming from a very beautiful city that is Parma. And uh, we, we have invited her uh, to this uh, series of uh, um, lectures. It's uh, the second one um, dedicated to uh, counter projects uh, of coexistence. Silvia is a, a thinker, is a, an activist, is a militant, is a professor, and she's, uh, say, expressing and writing and participating to debates, to uh, uh, yeah, concrete occasions of, uh, of protest since uh, the 1970s. She is a feminist, as you probably know, and she has a very clear materialistic uh, position. She has been uh, investigating the role of uh, uh, human reproduction in the process of capitalist accumulation. Just remember uh, her very important and famous book, uh, Caliban and the Witch, uh, from uh, 2015. Um, and uh, she also um, developed a feminist reading uh, of the politics of the commons. And this you, you can read in uh, Reenchanting uh, the World, a book of uh, 2018. Um, she's always very close to the concreteness, the materiality of the conditions of life. She's not abstract. She, she, she also makes experiences of uh, the, uh, all the reflections that uh, she uh, writes about. And always with this uh, reproductive sphere at the center, as a crucial one uh, to define a capacity to be autonomous or, or to find a, a type of, uh, um, of, of, of expression, let's say, or a space of expression. And I want to quote uh, uh, more or less, uh, I'm quoting uh, a, a sentence uh, uh, in uh, Reenchanting the World, uh, because the crisis of the capitalist uh, world should not become the crisis of our projects of social transformation. On the contrary, it, this condition of crisis should open uh, new possibilities of freedom, which is, I think, also a very constructive point of view uh, in, in respect to the, to the future and also in respect to the conditions of crisis in, in which we, we are. Um, she has uh, written, as I said, about the, the commons uh, from uh, this uh, feminist perspective and uh, the, the contrast or the, the, the contrast uh, be between uh, uh, commons and the new forms of exclusion or new forms of enclosure, and as uh, she, she has uh, uh, written. Um, she has also written um, a book, an interesting book about uh, the body, so beyond the periphery of the skin, rethinking, remaking, and reclaiming the body in contemporary uh, capitalism. And uh, I think that we, we have, this is very in interesting also for, uh, for us in this school of, of architecture to, to come back to, to the body. I don't know if uh, Cristina Bianchetti is uh, online, but she has uh, published recently a very nice book on, uh, on those questions. But in any case, to, to come back to the centrality of the body in any type of, uh, space and also in any type of uh, uh, radical and institutional uh, politics. So, um, Silvia, we would like you to trace the lines of your counter project of coexistence. How do you see today this possibility of countering the project of coexistence that is proposed, let's say, to, to us? And also that you can, you might help us to define maybe also its special qualities or uh, special characteristics. How should it be this uh, space of, uh, this counter space of, of coexistence? So we are very happy to listen to you. And uh, I want to thank uh, Elvira Pietrobon that has uh, proposed to invite you. And I want to thank Elvira because uh, is also thanks to her suggestions that I could start to know better your, your work. And uh, um, I give the floor to you and we are uh, um, very happy.
to be here with you. Please, when you like. <laughs> I was muted. Good evening to everybody and thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Elvira and Michael for inviting me today to this gathering and uh, where we're going to speak about counter projects, particularly relating to urban territorial spaces and our body relationship to it. Uh, of course, right now, my thoughts are going to go to a special territory to the territory of Palestine, which uh, seems to be on the verge of witnessing a genocide, a genocidal project. And uh, I hope that we can all agree to speak in resistance to this project, to speak in opposition, in protest. And uh, I'm uh, heartbroken that uh, you know, government that pretends to be democratic are in fact silence or in fact more than silence are in fact supporting, you know, the decision of the Israeli government to resolve the Palestinian process in this family. Now, about uh, counter project, um, I want to start by saying that um, this question is more than ever urgent. Uh, recently, the United Nations has told us that last year, that time, the number of people living in an urban environment has uh, overcome the number of people living in the valley. What is it, uh, he, there was a, a, a movement and uh, we could not hear you anymore. Uh, yes, that for the first time last year, the United Nations announced that for the first time in the history of humanity, the number of people living in an urban environment has been more than those living in a rural area. The United Nations presented this fact as a sign of progress, arguing and uh, assuming that urban life offers possibility. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, we, we hear you. Yes. Do you hear me now? So I was saying that the United Nations uh, presented the view that for the first time in the history of humanity, the number of people living in an urban environment has been higher than those living in rural areas. They have presented it as a sign of progress, assuming that life, urban life offers immense possibilities and is far richer and better for the world population. Uh, I, in fact, however, received this notice uh, with a great sense of uh, fear. And uh, because we know that uh, this, this phenomenon of the massive explosion of the urban population has been the result of a steady, steady expulsion of millions of people from their ancestral land, you know, due to partially climate change, entire areas of the world are becoming desertified, particularly in Africa. We're thinking, for example, of Ethiopia, Somalia, but also because of the politics that the European community and the United States have pushed forward for many years, the politics of and policies of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, that have pushed you know, structural adjustment programs that have popularized you know, entire population uh, in the name of a debt crisis, 
have forced governments from Africa to parts of Asia to Latin America to open their door, the doors of their country to many, many extractivist projects, petroleum drilling, fracking, mineral ext extraction, as well as agribusiness, you know, and even the taking over of cropland for uh, you know, building, for growing elephant grass, presumably for green gathering. So they've had to open, and that opening that uh, has meant taking land over, land that was owned communally, communally and used for crops, used for food production, taking it over, and uh, in fact, uh, privatizing it and uh, turning it into a source of destruction, the destruction of the reproduction of thousands and thousands of life. The great migratory movements that we have witnessed in the last three decades, you know, the migrants from Africa, Middle East into Europe, which by the way, have turned the Mediterranean into a grave. The migrant, the migration from Mexico, most of Latin America into the United States, which are creating catastrophic situation for thousands and thousands of people to this day. All those migratory movements are not accidental. These are not people looking for ventures, or, uh, but they are people who do not have a future in the country they come from. So the question of the urban space, the question of the urban space and what to do in this urban space, how to create livable communities, how to create communities that have the power to transform people's lives and turn what for many has been a defeat. Because when you have to leave your home, your land, your community, it is a defeat. To turn this defeat into actually a creation of new possibilities. So this discussion is extremely important. And uh, I would sum it up to say that uh, we could label you know, the project you know, as the creation of new commons the creation of new commons, no, not only the creation of new community, but the creation of communities, you know, where people are able to initiate activities, create social relations, right, that are working, organizing for the common good. And, uh, and uh, organizing in a way that uh, enhances their power, enhances the ability to resist, and at the same time, give them possibility to begin to construct something new. So what I'm going to talk you know, about this counter project, this counter project that I've been writing about in my several of my books, right? Uh, I want to stress that what I'm writing, what I'm talking about, it's not some utopian vision. It's not some vision that I've concocted, you know, out of my aspiration, although I have many aspirations. But it's something that I have, uh, you know, imagined and reflected upon from direct experience, from learning about, you know, what communities have done over the years, you know, in response to the processes that I was describing, in response to expropriation, expulsion, pauperization, and most of the evidence that I'm going to present is from Africa, is from Latin America, regions that have been at the center you know, of the politics that uh, I was mentioning the center of, of the war that international institutions like the IMF and the World Bank have been wages, you know, on uh, the rural, the peasantry of the world, as well as urban population, you know, uh, in the name of progress, in the name of development, 
in the name of pain, you know, the debts that presumably number of countries have accumulated, which is really most of cases when we go to look about the origin of these debts, we see that it's really, we are talking about an abomination. And this, the world is not too strong. Let's think, for example, let's reflect about the African debt, you know, which is being used you know, to underdevelop, to further underdevelop many African regions. What is the African debt? We have to ask who owes to who? What is happening? I, I've been muted. No, 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 everything is fine. It's just sometimes someone from online is uh, intervening. So we are muting them whenever they appear. Ah, okay. So I don't know where they come. So I was saying the African death, to speak of an African death is an abomination because imagine all, all these people that have been taken away from Africa, all the people, and then we still speak of an African death, you know, because uh, African countries, after the end of the anti-colonial struggle, took over, took some loans to catch up, to develop technologically, and those loans were at low interest rate. And then over time, the Federal Reserve of the United States increased the rate of interest on the dollar, and those loans became un un unpayable unmanageable. So the actual debt crisis is something that has been artificially created. It's a kind of financial recolonization of the countries that have been uh, structurally adjusted, right? So in this situation, the people have been forced to leave, you know, uh, the rural areas because their communal lands have been privatized because their croplands have been devoted to petroleum drilling or agribusiness, like in Latin America, the production of soya, et cetera. No? Uh, I've had to reinvent, I've had to reinvent new forms of existence. I've had to reinvent who have been able to survive because of collective solidarity, because of collective work. And out of this collective solidarity and collective work, you know, have developed a new society of commons, a new society of commons that in very direct, organized or spontaneous way is now beginning to emerge, is now beginning to be visible in many parts of the world. For instance, and uh, I hope Elvira will speak about that or in the discussion period, one phenomenon that has been occurring you know, in Africa and uh, pretty much throughout you know, the former third world you know, has been urban farming. In other words, those expelled, those expelled from the rural area, right? coming from peasant community, forced to urbanize, you know, forced to live in cities, uh, have responded to the new situation immediately you know, by taking over some land, taking over urban land, not immediately used, and beginning to plant something, some food, some peppers, some tomatoes, some, some garlic, in order to be able you know, not to depend completely on the market, to regain some form of survival and some form of autonomy, and to be able also to reconnect, to reconnect with the land and with the interaction with the land, knowing that when we lose the land, we not only lose a particular form, you no. Know, of a particular resource, a form of survival, but also a whole set of knowledges, you know, 
uh, in Africa, for instance, and I, I learned that when I was in Nigeria in the early 1980s, where I confronted directly the consequences of the structural adjustment program and the IMF program for Africa. I learned that in the past, people did not use chloroquine pills to combat malaria because they could grow herbs. They had medical properties. And then this was true for many other type of infirmities, many, many kinds of herbs. So a whole knowledge is lost as well as social relation when the communal land are destroyed. And this is what you know, the last three decades has brought in many parts of the world at the hands of the World Bank, IMF, international capitalism. We have witnessed a new expansion of capitalist relation organized through the tool of the debt crisis, you know, which has again rep reproduced what Marx wrote about in volume one of Capital, the separation of the producer from the means of production. And the separation of the pollution is either violent takeover of land, violent expulsion of people from the land, or you know, through financial means, you know, the pauperization of community and the forced exodus of these communities towards areas where they may find some form of employment. But the recreation, what I'm speaking about, as a first contrary project, uh, as a first uh, project of not only resistance, but reconstruction, is this phenomenon of the urban farming, the massive takeover by individual and groups of urban land and the creation of an urban farm. There's a number of articles and researchers that, for example, say that in some of the African capitals, right, in Kinshasa and other capitals, the distinction between urban and rural, right, rural, the word rural has made its appearance. We have a new urban society in the sense that the traditional distinction in capitalism between city and country is beginning to break down. So massive is this process of the reclamation of land, the reclamation of land in urban environment. And this is a phenomenon that has also taken place all throughout Latin America. We call those huertos urbanos, and that has also then expanded into the cities of Europe and the United States. In the United States, for instance, all through the 1980s and 90s into the present, we have seen the growth of urban garden. In New York in the 90s, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of urban gardens. Some of them, were destroyed by the administration, but many have survived. You know? And these urban gardens have been extremely important because not only they have provided food, not only they have circulated knowledges, but they have become new hubs of new collective social relationships, places where people meet, where cultural interchanges are taking place. People from Africa are meeting people, you know, from Latin America, you know, cultural uh, ideas and, and projects are being exchanged. So this is a very important element that, and important because I think, and I think, of course, I'm saying the obvious, that our relationship with the land is fundamental, fundamental to any transformative project, fundamental to any transformative project. The struggle over the land, not accidentally today, is the most bloody struggle in the world. Because the moment we lose the land, we lose completely 
the possibility of really an autonomous life. You know, so the celebration that the United Nations is making, you know, of uh, urbanization on a massive scale. I guess with the idea that there will be one day in which everybody will be in the cities and the rural area, the waters, the fields, the land, the crops, the forests, the seas, will all be in the land of corporation. This is the dream of capital. This is the project of international capitalism to basically not allow anyone to be able to have a direct relationship with the land, not be able to live off the land. Because the moment you are in a direct relationship with the land, you cannot be exploited in the ways in which capitalism now wants to exploit us. No. Urbanization means you do not control where your food is coming from. You do not control the quality of the water, the quality of the air, which means that an enormous element of our resistance, an enormous element of control and decision making is taken away from us. So the idea of urbanization as an instrument of progress, as a tool of progress, it's really a lie. And I think it is very important that we see wherever we are, wherever our struggle is, and uh, that the struggle over the land is important in rural area and is important also more and more in the urban areas as well, right? To regain, if you are expelled from the fields, from the peasant communities, then we recreate them. I think this is one of the phenomena that is most interesting, most important that is happening today you know, across the world. At the same time also, there are other, many, many other forms of reconstruction of the commons that have been taking place now for decades. And they are also incredibly uh, important. And for instance, the multifaceted process whereby in different countries, you know, the organization of the reproduction of our day-to-day -day life is becoming more and more communal. Uh, capitalism has organized our reproductive life in such a way that it separates us from each other. You know, the nuclear family, the ideology of privacy has really created many little worlds that is, you know, in, in which they seem to be patterned on what the philosopher, the German philosopher Leibniz used to speak of, you know, monads without windows and without wars, you know, this self-enclosure, this self-enclosure, you know, into the familiar life where you are afraid to talk, you know, to other people, even sometimes people in your extended family to tell your problem, you know, you keep your secret because you are afraid of this idea of the privacy. And all of this in a choreography in which we are constantly told more and more every day that we have to be careful of other people. Other people are a threat, you know. We have to think of ourselves, our interests first. Think of our interests first. We cannot really trust other people. We have to learn to defend ourselves from others. All this continuous bombardment to create this trust, to create a world in which we are individually self-enclosed, the individualization of life, which in reality weakens us. No, in reality, it's a really a quick road to be defeated, to be dependent on the powers that be. This is beginning to break down. I think that out of the necessity of life, you know, out of the need not to be defeated, and uh, in front of this uh, war on the condition of our reproduction, which has been taking place 
now more and more and more intensely than ever for many years, you know, particularly you know, in the former colonial world. I say former, but actually there's a new form of colonization, you know, organized mostly through financial means, but also with the military in the background, because we now live in a state of permanent warfare. You know. So now, no, we are in a situation in which, as I said before, more and more people are forced to invent new forms of life. And they do so mostly by recreating, reconstructing everyday reproduction in a way that brings them together, that is more collective. And women have a key role in it. Women are really the ones who have been the major protagonist of the creation of new commons. And so we have seen, for instance, you know, in Latin America, starting with the response of women to the coup in Chile, the Pinochet coup in Chile, you know, when the government was rounding up people and um, imprisoning people. And at the same time, new financial policies were being introduced. They were massively, massively increasing the cost of life. We saw the women came out to the community and they began to cook in the, in the streets, create what you call all as comunes, you know, the common pot out of desperation, going to shop together, cook together, to be able to give everybody a chance to survive, stretch the resources that were diminishing. And at the same time, that moment of coming together, of breaking the isolation, breaking the fear, we now know was the beginning of a resistance. You no, know, by cooking together, women spoke with each other, gained some confidence, overcame some of the fear. You no, know? and that practice of the comedores populares, the collective kitchen, the cooking, not in an isolation of the kitchen, but cooking for a lot of people, you no, know, has spread to many, many communities, especially those communities that in Argentina are called. Villas Miserias, the, 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 the communities of misery. These are communities organized by people who come from the peasant area, from the rural area, who cannot live there. They're forced to urbanize. And then they take over land at the periphery of cities. And they have to create new societies, they have to create new communities. They build houses with collective work, they build streets, they build places for first aid, urban gardens, and collective kitchen. And the women are so important here again, you know, both both in the creation of first aid, which means also you know, reconnecting with ancestral methods of care and cure, right? Recuperating ancestral knowledge about the medical property of things and other medical practices. There is a whole ancestral knowledge which we have forgotten, always assuming, you know, that in capitalism, with progress, we know better and better. But now there is an effort to also recuperate, you know, some knowledge that over the years, thousands of years, have been acquired about the body, about the relationship with nature. Yeah? Another form of uh, counter project is the urban assemblies, right? neighborhood assemblies, assembleas vicinales, you know, where what people regain is the 
collective decision making, the collective decision making about issues that are important for their lives, about the daily reproduction. So this breakdown of the isolation, you no, know, which has many aspects, a material aspect, recuperation of land, recuperation of resources, collective labor, you no, know, and also cultural, psychological, political, beginning to think of a common good beginning to think not of individual interests, but of the common good, of building a society organized around the principle of the common good. This is very, very important. You know? And also among the projects, the conscious, willful reclaiming of collective memory, the memory of past struggles the memory of what has taken place in the environment in which we live. All too often we see the destruction of so much of our territory. And it's a destruction that is not only material, but is cultural. When buildings are taken down, a whole history is taken down. So reclaiming that history, it's also reclaiming our relationship you know, with the people and the struggle that have taken place in the past. It's also making those who die present in our life, connecting with their desire, with their struggle, gaining strength from what they wanted to do, from their own project, becoming their eyes, becoming their voices. I think all of that is a very, very, crucial counter project to see ourselves on a continuum, not to separate the living from the dead, to recreate in ourselves the story, the will, the desire of those who came before us and struggled before us, to become their voices, to become their eyes, to say really present so that uh, we know that if we ourselves die, if we ourselves suffer in this project, we will not be completely forgotten. That the end of our individual life is not the end of all that we wanted to be and all that we lived for. So I think also that within this context, to recuperate a different relationship to our body has been extremely important. I think we still are beginning to understand what the separation, what the process of urbanization and also the end of a world in which our activities imply a constant interchange with nature, with the world of animals. We still are beginning to understand you know, what that has done to us, what that has done to our body, to our sense of being in the world. You know, the kind of impoverishment. So the United Nations see life in the city as a great enrichment. What they do not understand is also the impoverishment that leaving the countryside, leaving the rural area, leaving a whole relationship with the natural world right and uh, what that implies you know for instance often we look at nature in a totally alienated way we take a picture when we go to the sea we have an album with a few pictures but we don't have the sense of those profound rhythms of the natural world how the plants the the, the seas the we don't understand we don't have those knowledges that allowed people thousands of years ago to navigate the seas at night, you know, to cross miles and miles, guided by the wind, guided, you know, by the stars. We have lost the sense of the gray metabolism that continuously recreates life across the world. 
And this has an impact, the fact that the growth of depression, suicides, and uh, the sense of a, a devitalization of our life, which has become growing and growing, particularly in recent years. You know, we know, for instance, that uh, depression has become the most common disease among women depression, work, 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 no, no sense of an alternative. At least uh, among children, young people, the number of suicides have grown. It used to be the elderly killed themselves. Now it's the younger people. The growth of violence, the growth of incredible uh, violence that is taking place, you know, often organized, clearly organized, from above, you know, as a response to struggle. But also often, you know, growing from below in the sense of uh, sense of hostility, general hostility towards the world by the sense of profound dissatisfaction that one has with the world one lives in. So I think that today, you know, the way to really begin to create a new society and to begin to live in a world in which we can start from the present to have a sense to experience to have a taste of the world in which we want to live is the most imperative task in our life I cannot imagine anything that is more creative than dedicating what energy we have you know, to this process, to break down all, all the restrictions that have been imposed on us and to free, begin to free ourselves in a, with our connection with other people from the fears that capitalism has implanted in our psyche, in our bodies. I think this is the counter project. They see the others, people as a wealth, as a, a means of enrichment of our life and not as a threat. To live life in which our bodies are extended. Our bodies are not confined as I wrote in a book, the title of a book I recently published. No, they are not confined by the periphery of our skin, but we have our body extended, continuously affected by other people, open, open to other people, open to nature. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, implies changing the material condition of our life. I've often written, and perhaps some have misinterpreted it, that changing the way we look is not enough. We have to change the material condition of our life. And we have to change them in such a way that we break down the isolation in which capitalism forces us to live. And in breaking down that isolation, we gain far more power, far more knowledge, far more strength in confronting the state, in confronting all the powers they want to enclose us. And, uh, and we also begin to create from the present something of the world that we hope to construct in the future. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. And was the was I did you hear what I said or was it always closed? It was perfect. <laughs> huh? Can you hear me? Yes, I do hear you. Yes. Great. So it was really perfect. I know there are people online and in the room. Okay. So I have questions already. Otherwise, uh, Elvira, if you're already there. Oh, it actually came through. It was not because when I finished speaking, I saw that I was mute. Ah, no, 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 it was just during oh. the speech, perfect. So the presentation was there. <laughs> Otherwise, okay, it was... All right, very good. 
I don't know if there are questions in here among the students of the MIS or the public more in general. Or Elvira, I don't know if you want to maybe react. I just want to make uh, sure that. Uh, I think we have a, a problem with your connection, which is very bad at the moment. And now? Slightly better. I think you have your camera on, otherwise, you switch off the camera, maybe. Okay. No, it's better. There's something. No, no it's around me. Hello? Yeah. Do you hear me now? Yeah, yes. now we can. Okay. So it's a problem because um, there's some noise uh, around me. They're building uh, uh, just uh, next to, to the house where I'm speaking from. Uh, I just want like, to thank you, uh, Silvio Federici, and uh, also you. Uh, in Lausanne for letting this seminar uh, to be uh, and to um, ask to participate. I, I would rather ask uh, Paula Vigano if she wants to, to react, <laughs> not me, and uh, maybe uh, on the question on what, what, uh, what is a city today? Maybe uh, there's a question uh, on uh, we can talk about. Uh, in this uh, context today. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think that it would be much better if you can uh, maybe start uh, your uh, dialogue with uh, Silvia Federici and uh, let this dialogue open to other questions. So maybe you, you can bring some of your experience because Silvia is starting from experiences. Uh, Elvira is in, uh, in the Mali in this moment in Mali and uh, and uh, she's uh, in a way moving because of some problems of war. So um, Elvira, if you want to bring uh, some reflections on the question of the transformation of the African city and that can react very well, I think, to what Silvia was uh, speaking about. Uh, okay, thank you, Paola. Um, so just let me say that um, uh, I was deeply moved when I read some of uh, uh, the writings from Silvio Federici and uh, in particular uh, Reenchanting uh, the World, Feminism and the Politics of uh, the Commons. And uh, Silvia uh, used to explain how many of uh, a reflection on the commons arise from uh, her experience uh, of living in Nigeria. And as she pointed out in women, land struggle and the reconstruction of the, the commons, the land of West Africa is still, uh, though changing, a land of commons. And this is true today uh, in Mali, uh, both uh, territorial scale and at the, the city level. But uh, I, I should say that what was really a revelation for me uh, reading her work uh, was to conceive uh, uh, of the possibility of taking a, a feminist perspective to look at ongoing processes and spatial and urban forms in particular. I think of uh, the role of uh, reproductive work carried out mainly by women uh, in the construction uh, of uh, the city. I think of the forms and relationships between domestic and shared spaces and how reproductive work is central to the pattern of uh, everyday movements. So in a way, taking a, a feminist perspective uh, allows, uh, allows us and me to, to enlighten some of the special characteristics of uh, Western African uh, cities. And this uh, uh, could stimulate a, a broader reflection on the project of the city and the, the territory that places uh, reproductive work and an idea of uh, subsistence uh, at the center. Uh, so maybe uh, Silvia uh, can elaborate more uh, on this idea of feminism uh, as a lens to look at urban uh, realities. And maybe also on the differences uh, and possible parallels too between the, the southern cities 
uh, she experienced and, and those in the North? Yes, I think, uh, I think there is a very, uh, Elvira, if what you're saying is absolutely crucial. You know, I think women are in the lead internationally in reconstructing the series. Uh, the most important developments that are taking place are really led you know, by women who, because they are fundamental, a subject of reproductive work, you know, they are really the most committed to transforming the city in a way that uh, is hospitable, is reproductive, uh, and, and in the process of breaking down so many of the forms of enclosure that we encountered. So restructuring the urban space. So there is a debate that is going on among feminists about what kind of urban space do we need? You know, and uh, we are speaking here, you know, in the Department of Architecture. We need the architects to really begin an urban architectural revolution because we need to have cities that are open, you know, to new type of architectural spatial organization and organization that in fact foster collective communal relation. We need spaces that are you know, open to collective gatherings. We need buildings that are organized in a way that reproduction. Reproduction is not an individual enterprise, but more and more is social, is collective. We need that streets do not separate us from each other and are used only for the quick, you know, uh, transportation of goods and only for commercial purposes, but are in fact connecting us organically, connecting building, connecting communities in a way, you know, when we march in our demonstration, we say, who streets? Our streets. And I think the women are in the process of making that, of organizing in such a way that the streets become more of our streets, right? And uh, I mentioned above all, you know, what has been taking place in uh, some metropoles of Africa or cities in Latin America, where we can actually already see in a very visible way, the product of this transformation, right? As I was saying, the collective kitchen, you know, the gardens, the, the assembly, the, the form of assembly as a form of collective decision making, you know, uh, and uh, the, the proliferation of collective groups that are dealing with the uh, issues of, uh, you know, sanitary issues, you know, uh, issues of. Uh, the protecting of children and organizing of child raising collectively. We see that. I think we're beginning to see also in the North. You know? For instance, the practice of the urban garden and uh, the struggle over housing. You know, increasingly, we hear that the struggle over housing is not only a struggle to diminish the rents, which is important, or a struggle to even have a house because more and more, because of the high cost you know, of housing, so many people are forced to live in the street. But also what kind of houses, how to organize the house, which now is organized in a way that reproductive work, you know, is continuous and becomes more and more isolated. The new apartments that are built, you can see the kitchen, the kitchen that used to be the center of the home, the place, you know, where everybody gathered so that if you were cooking, you were not alone. Other people could help you. You could talk and, and, and converse. And now the kitchen is becoming this small, small space. And the person who will be working there will be completely isolated. So 
we really, this is the struggle now. And it's above all a feminist struggle because we are the ones who are much more affected and much more interested in reorganizing the reproduction that has immediate implications for our work, for our mental sanity, for the relationship with other people, whether we are alone or we can be with other people in certain spaces. So I think that these are the projects that we need to be engaged in. And also, as I mentioned before, reconnecting in an urban space. You now the urban and the rural break down that separation, that historic separation, which has made the city very parasitic, very parasitic on the rural area, has made urban uh, citizen very parasitic on the peasantry. Uh, Elvira has mentioned Maria Mies, and I want to mention Maria here, you know, we say, I said before, we have to be the voice of those who came before us, and I want to be the voice of Maria right here. She died May 14, the night of May 14 of this year, and it's been a great, great loss. You know, Maria has been one of the main activists and, and theoretical, feminist theoretical thinkers of our time. And as Elvira said, you know, she always fought for a society where life would be built around subsistence, for subsistence, not for the accumulation of wealth, not for competition, not for exploitation, but actually where the production of life would be the end and will be the center, you know, of social relations. And, uh, you know, Maria Mies has written very, very powerful words, very powerful analysis of what happens when in the history of capitalism, the production, for example, of food and agricultural production becomes more and more distant from the places of consumption. And we have seen this being extremized with the process of globalization. If we go to the supermarket in the United States or in Europe, we see products coming from Asia. We see products coming from Africa. What happens? First of all, we do not know who are the people who are producing those products. We do not know how much blood those products have costed. If they were produced in a place expropriated from other people, if they were pro produced with pesticides, etc., we have no idea how they were produced. And so we benefit, so to speak, you know, of, of situation that may have been extremely problematic, but we don't know. Secondly, when you have that separation, you, know, you have the problem of trash. In the rural areas, there's no trash. Trash becomes part, is recycled into the ground. In urban area, in urban area, you have the accumulation of trash. Trash has no place to go. The only place it goes, it's burnt and it goes into somebody's lungs or it is exported as to Africa. It's thrown into the sea, right? So these are problems. These are serious problems we have to confront. Maria Mies spoke of trash as a negative commons. She said, those of us who live in the North, so-called political North, those of us who live in urban area have to look at the problem of trash as our problem, as our negative commons. And organize in such a way, for instance, that we do not produce trash and fight against the production of trash and fight to reconnect production and consumption, to put an end to the constant distancing of consumption and production, because that Distancing creates an irresponsibility, creates ignorance. We don't know 
we don't know the condition of production and create irresponsibility. What do we do with the trash? We have no, we find ourselves irresponsible. So this is an example of how we begin to reconstruct our cities, how we create new collective responsibility is beginning to realize what are the forces that are now you know, constructing our environment. You know, why, when we go to the supermarket, we don't know if what we eat is going to kill us or is going to nourish us. You know? So this is what really must be central part of an urban agenda. What kind of building, what kind of streets, where, what kind of food production, what kind of sanitary condition and, uh, and, and, and means you know, to produce our health. This must be the center of the feminist agenda. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. I think that maybe now there could be some comments or some questions from uh, from the from the room here. Silence. Someone was uh, not really very happy at the end of the of the of the speech so maybe you have some comments uh hi <laughs> thank you for your uh, talk um i wondered you mentioned uh ur urban uh, gardening and urban uh, um as a way of uh commoning and reconnecting with the land um, but I wondered if you think it has this same connotation in uh, northern, western uh, countries, because sometimes it can also be or can be looked upon as uh, almost as uh, something fancy or uh, fashionable and um, maybe... In addition to that, if you um, can imagine other ways of commoning or give an example of other ways of commoning in uh, urban areas. Yes, absolutely. For instance, I mentioned the urban garden, right? Actually, I don't know. I, you know, I'm sure there must be some place in which is a fancy I know in the United States, the, the urban garden were mostly produced by immigrants. Immigrants from Latin America, from Africa, and from the south of the United States. And these immigrants in the 1980s, beginning with the 1980s, often came to the city. They came from areas where they were used to produce their food. And often they were in areas where they were at land, abandoned, and sometimes, you know, very, very dirty. They began to clean up pieces of land in their neighborhood where they may be even syringes of drug addicts. They began to clean up and then they began to turn them into gardens. And those gardens became places of social life not only places for producing food and quite a bit of food, but not only producing zucchini and potatoes, but producing social relations. So our experience in the United States is it's a working class experience. It's not an experience of uh, you know, um, luxury, the urban garden, right? Uh, but there are other experiences too. For instance, there have been many, many initiatives to connect consumers directly with farmers. Here we have community-supported agriculture. This is one of the many forms of organization whereby people in an urban environment connect with farmers. And many times you can even go to the farm and see how things are produced. And you support, you know, you give them, for example, some money at the beginning of the season, and then they bring you the food. So they, you, 
bypass the market, bypass. So you actually, you actually contribute to people remaining on the land and reconnect with the land. I've seen that in Europe, there are many different varieties. At the outskirts of Geneva, for instance, you know, I know that there's a huge area, agricultural area, where a lot, a lot of people, you know, are growing food and you can have access to the food if you do some work on it. And I know of many people like in Geneva activists who have this re direct relationship to land, which is really in very urban environment. So that a, idea, that, that problematic, which is so central to any concept of urban planning, right? Of breaking down, you know, making the, what I call the urban, urban, real, uh, ruralize the urban space, ruralize the urban space, right? That this is not just uh, a fancy uh, project, but it's actually something that a lot of people are putting energy into. Thank you. And that we need to do, because where do we get our food? In a supermarket with more and more, you know, you are in New York and you might get food from, I don't know, uh, you know, Asia, or you get food, or you are in, we are really, really in a supermarket. You have, you know, the local products. And as I said, the capitalist tendency is to more and more separate the place of production from the place of consumption. And that creates a whole host of vital problem, of very destructive problem. So that is an issue to reconnect production and consumption. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, as a quick point, I think we were on mute when you finished talking. So the silence was us giving you a round of applause, just that, uh, just that you know that. Um, you talked about the commons and I liked your use of waste and you said irresponsibility and and you spoke before about the responsible commons and I'm, and it feels a lot the the feminism commons has a lot to do with responsibility for everyone taking responsibility for the commons and everyone caring for it and then which in an urban space is you know caring for our common spaces or our public spaces and i was just wondering if you could maybe just elaborate on that just for a little bit for us please yeah, I think it's basically the whole ethos is the political ethos, you know, that we live with. What is that we take responsibility for, right? What is that we take responsibility, you know? So capitalism encourages us to actually feel responsible for the very, very limited, <clears throat> limited sphere of life and social relation, you know, our family and right. But instead, I think that what we need to promote when we speak about creating uh, projects that reconstruct the change, transform our society, our cities, you know, uh, the right to the city, you know, David Harvey and many others, Lefebvre always insisted that the right to the city is a collective right. And with a collective right is also a collective responsibility the right to the city is not just the right, and this is very important to take from the city. It's the right to transform it. It's the right to change it. And with the right, central must come the responsibility for the streets, for the, for the parks, for the, you know, there's a tremendous, tremendous struggle that is now going on in the United States. One of the biggest struggle is taking place in the city of Atlanta, you know, where there is this perverse, horrendous project to create a huge armory. It's called Cup City. It's a huge, huge building that presumably is devoted to training the police to become better, more understanding. In reality, we know that uh, it uh, reproduces 
the late 19th century creation of armories. In the late 19th century, starting from 1870s, in cities like New York and other cities, where there was a strong, at a time of crisis, strong working class social movements, they created these armories. They're big military bases. Cop City, Cop City in Atlanta, it's a project to recreate something like that. And there's a tremendous, tremendous struggle. And that struggle is very interesting now. It's really bringing together activists from all over the United States. People are going there, there's been a lot of arrest. It's a very, very fierce struggle. It's a struggle for the land. Cop City will be built on indigenous land. It's a struggle for ecology. It will destroy many, many trees. And it's a struggle for freedom. Cop City, it's a new turn in the process of repression of social movements and social struggle. So I think that this is one example of how it all comes together. The protection of ecology and the protection of social relation and social freedoms you know, are, are intimately connected. And uh, I, I think uh, that uh, this is, this is a, a struggle that is taking place in so many, it's a continuation of the struggle to defend the forests uh, or to defend uh, you know, our rivers and seas, for example, from becoming trash bin, places where trash can be downloaded by the tons as it is happening now. So this is what is called regaining the urban space, transforming the urban space. You know, the responsibility that we have, you know, not only for the home, but for the whole. And that can only be a process of really collective movement. And more specifically, the process of creating, and this I think is so important politically, I come back from you, creating common grounds, the common grounds in which different movements find the connection with each other, see their struggle continuous with the struggle of the others. Feminist, ecological, uh, struggle against you know, the police and carceral society, you know, struggle for different sanitary system, etc. Finding a common ground because the fragmentation that we often have, it's really a recipe for defeat. And this, I think, in this moment that we are confronting such a terrible, terrible political situation, uh, it is it's really imperative, this common ground. And I believe the feminist movement is the movement that has the capacity, has the potential to provide that common ground. Because we start from reproduction and reproduction is the broadest terrain of struggle. Reproduction is food, is sexuality, is children, is procreation, is sanity, is, is uh, healthcare, is education, is production of knowledge, is agriculture. Reproduction in a way is the terrain on which what enables us to live you know, is produced. And in that sense, the feminist movement who always says we need to put life at the center, you know, has the potential to, to be the promoter of the creation of this common ground. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the very inspiring uh, discussion. Um, maybe you already mentioned this while while uh, you were speaking now, but I was just uh, thinking in terms of uh, this, we discuss a lot about the growth of the city, which has happened historically because of 
the invisible labor that has been done by women. And but not only that, because we most of us here are architects and urbanists, uh, the city has also been designed from the perspective of men and from it has been thought and designed and um, you know planned by men. But we of course we we know that there's a slight not that much but slight change in that now how how do you see any kind of change in the in the perception of space collective collectively because there's more women involved there's more bodies in urban spaces in general although we know that urban spaces are still not equal but do you think there's a change in almost the atmosphere around discussion and seeing of spaces especially collective spaces in, in general yeah there is there is a change so for example i see now you know in feminist spaces that there is uh, an interest in the question of urban planning in the question for example of the nature of the housing struggle you know what do we what do we fight for for the houses in a, in a, in a struggle for housing and uh, but it's still it's still at the beginning and uh, we still do not have, you know, by the way, this is not new. This is not completely new. There's been a feminist interest in urban space and urban planning that, you know, for, for many, many years. I don't know. I, I suggest if you don't know that you read a book called by Dolores Hayden. Dolores Hayden, it's an, an amazing book. She actually has written several, several books. Uh, this is one of the, the most famous. It's called The Grand Domestic Revolution. The Grand Domestic Revolution. It's actually a history, you know, of feminist thinking on urban space. Feminist thinking on urban space. It goes back to the 1920s and even the 1880s, even the end of the 19th century. She actually shows Dolores Eisen shows that uh, from the 1880s and perhaps even earlier, you know, to the 1930s, there was a very lively, active feminist interest in urban planning, urban design, and the reconstruction of family space. This was connected with the idea of liberating women from the isolation of the home and the isolation of the family. And she shows the many family, many feminists, revolutionaries, anarchists, reformists, had a whole conception of a different kind of home. They had a conception of a home with collective kitchen. And she shows, for example, that in cities like New York, the development of restaurants was directly influenced by this feminist writing who basically said enough of all these women cooking separately in their homes. Let's have building that has a collective kitchen in the ground floor. You know, in some of the reform scheme, or oh, the idea of course was that this collective kitchen, you know, some of the workers will be immigrant workers. But nevertheless, there was a tremendous idea that uh, the home as it is for many women becomes a prison and that we have to collect it. So there's a long, long, you know, um, basically thinking. And, and she shows also what has been the institutional thinking in the United States, you know, the construction of the little home in the suburbia had a very, very specific political meaning. Had a, the, the meaning of it was to prevent workers, prevent families to organize with each other. It was the idea of basically constructing the places of reproduction away from the places of work. So there's to isolate the workers and that the home would be organized in such a way that more and more they would absorb all the energy of the family. Women would have a whole room for ironing, 
men were given a loan to mow the lawn on Sunday, so you didn't go to a union meeting. She did a fantastic job. We need to do the work for the present because we have opposite trends taking place. There is a battle now. I live in New York and I see it every day. There are communities, particularly immigrant communities, where the effort is to come together, is to basically build collective ways of being. And then, and architecturally too. And then we have, uh, you know, the Wall Street. We have the constant construction of skyscrapers, higher and higher and higher, separating workers from the ground, you know, uh, violating every law of ecology, of preservation of resources. Right, as if capital is so afraid, as if the capitalists are so afraid that they have to shoot themselves up into the sky to escape the street, you know. And we see these nice skyscrapers going up. So I think that we really have to reconnect to the struggle that are not beginning today. They have a history. I'm sure they have a history in Switzerland. I'm sure they have a history in different countries of women rethinking the home, rethinking the community, and, uh, and see you know, how can they become an inspirational force also for the present. Um, hello, I was also the enthusiast fan at the end. Um, and I think I was just also shouting for all of us in this room, which was very inspiring, as said before. Um, I think you've given us also practical ways of um, engaging with the issue. For me, I'm curious also um, in regard to your knowledge of the architectural practice culture. Um, and also bearing in mind that I don't know, people also feel like they need to engage in this culture because this is how they get to earn their money. This is how uh, which they get... culture can you please say it again? They uh, can you where from where? Yeah, no, could they tell me which culture? The, the architectural practice culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I get it. See. Um, yeah. And people feeling like this is the way they need to earn their um their bread. Um yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, it being a culture that is also very closely linked to capitalism and yeah. and um, I think my I'm I'm I want to know have you made thoughts on how this counter um, counter product or counter project um, works um, for architects as well in in this culture specifically. Um, and I think also just to know, I mean, you have greatly pointed that the feminism movement as a platform that can bring a lot of people together and it having such potential, but bearing in mind that it also has, um, or sometimes also has, sees, shows signs of a great polarized view to the extent that people are also, um, I don't know, getting out of the, of, of the feminism movement based on their definition of waves i don't know um how you also view that um like how you i mean you you see the potential that what um maybe um questions or worries you have yeah in regard to this i guess yeah and <laughs> yeah. yeah. broad questions so let me try some things eh? first of all i think about the architectural culture and, and students of architecture I think the students of architecture and urban planning, uh, they really had needed a strong historical background. I think they need a start because I think particularly, you know, we have all went through it, right? We, so much has happened and uh, we need to know uh, what comes to my mind immediately. I hear urban planning, agriculture. I'm thinking of, for instance, the United States. And forgive me if my, my examples are from here now. Um, the way 
urban restructuring has been used in the US, for instance, to destroy black communities. In the way it has been used under the guise, for example, of building a highway, being to actually recreate, destroy community, social struggle, you know, using the urban development, the, the history of how urban development and architecture have been used to destroy communities. And that this, this is a story that runs through all through the history of the United States, down, down to present, down to present. And for example, you know, urban renewal in, in the South Bronx destroyed communities that lived in very disastrous conditions, but nevertheless had, had created strong, strong ties. Uh, immigrant community, black communities, and then comes urban development, destruction of buildings, and that's scattering of people who had the really create. So I think the architects and people are dealing with urban have to immerse themselves in that history, understand that this is not just, understand the strong strategic political dimension of architecture. Architecture has been a tool of power, a tool for restructuring social relation and political relation, for changing the social fabric and the power relation and creating your hierarchy, deepening hierarchies. I think it's very imperative to bring within architectural studies, architectural discussion, that dimension of the story. Feminism. Actually, today, you know, you're right. You know, we talk about feminism in the plural. We talk about feminisms because there are feminisms that I don't identify with. That I, that, you know, I'm speaking, I'm now speaking of a feminism that developed right from the 70s. They always had an anti capitalist dimension that never saw that you know, the condition of women was the ultimate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They always saw that you cannot change the condition of women without changing the society. There is no way of just saying, yes. And a feminism that just talk about not women as women, but women as subject of particular form of exploitation. Women as political subject insofar as subject of a particular form of exploitation and subject of particular specific forms of struggle, right? Of particular, so for us, we use the word women, women's liberation, the way black people use black as an, a signal for political struggle. Black is not a biological definition, it's a political, category for the black power movement, the black movement. So for us, women was the same, you know, and had an anti, so you're right. Their feminism were actually are in fact, you know, using some of the rhetoric of the feminist movement to integrate women into the capitalist society. And this is the feminism of the United Nations, the four conferences that have taken place you know, in Beijing, and in, in Mexico City, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we have to be very specific when we speak of what kind of feminism, you know? But I think that uh, the feminism that I speak about creating a common ground is because it's a feminism that basically speaks about the importance, right? The importance of, you know, when we say placing life as a center, we speak about common good, you know? Uh, we speak about overcoming individualism. We're speaking about valorizing people's life and people's work, you know, and uh, above and beyond the accumulation of wealth. This is the feminism that we speak of. And therefore, it's a feminism that is not limited to women, right? But speaks from 
a broad area of activities and therefore speaks from the need and for the need of broad network of movements going from movements for the land to movement you know for a different health system out of the market you know movement for education scholarization out of the market knowledge production out of the market you know connecting for instance you know with movement uh, for you know free housing mm -hmm. and movement for housing that uh, encourage encourage communal collective relation that have common spaces i've seen in europe in switzerland right you guys are in lausanne i mean i was in zurich uh, I was in Zurich, and in Zurich there is a, one incredible, very, very interesting experiment. Uh, it's called Krafter, uh, what is it called? Um, oh my God, the, the, the German word is now Kraftwerken. It's a, it's a product of a long initiative by a number of activists starting in the 90s who have taken over an old industrial center, you know, which had been abandoned. Then they discovered a law, a very old law, buried in the books, you know, of the Zurich town, that says that the, the, the city has to give a certain money of people who want to do, and they used that to get some money to refurbish this area. And now they have 300 people, 300 family, living in a kind of communal way with a lot of common spaces, a lot of common spaces, spaces for children, spaces for guests, spaces for assemblies, spaces for workshops, spaces for all kinds of activities, as well as in, in apartment for individual families. Kraftwerke, I think it's called, Kraftwerke. Zurich has been a place of experimentation, you know, um, and I think now they are pl planning to build a new one. This is not the revolution, but it's a great project and terrain of experimentation. We are now experimenting, learning, how do we want to live together? We don't know. We have to create it we know that we have certain needs we know that we are dissatisfied with the way we are living now so this is this is the kind of things that beginning to create this kind of project Yeah. Okay. Maybe one. I have another question. I think, um, if you, I I like what you said at the end. It kind of jumps on this whether, um, I mean the bigger picture of capitalism, um, and I think also I guess the question of of powers and you speak a lot about the United Nations, which shows your criticism of the United Nations. Um, but yeah, how to tackle in a way the bigger monster that is a system. Um, yeah, um, I think you have given us thoughts, but I don't know, maybe I, uh, more more points on this or more, uh, I guess, thinkings, more of your thinkings on this, if possible. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, there are a lot of things have to do with your locality, with your situation, right? I'm inspired by a lot of places. At the same time, and things that I've been doing with other women, at the same time, I also understand that, you know, certain things cannot be imported and exported. But nevertheless, 
they begin. So I think that when we look, you know, I think the kind of picture, if you look at the, at the, at the map of the world, right? And we look at the urban gardens of Africa, of Kinshasa, of, you know, in Seoul, many, many parts of in, uh, Asian metropolis, where they say everywhere there is a piece of land, you know, people are putting crops, you know, people are planting things, this uh, recuperation of the soil, you know, and then, you know, we look at, uh, you know, the projects like uh, you know, in housing of, of creating, you know, taking over, creating buildings where they have collective spaces, you know, and all of this, we look at uh, the comedores populares, the idea of creating assemblies. So for instance, you know, this new, I don't know, I don't know in Switzerland, but I know in the United States, there's now more and more interested in social movement to have assemblies, right? Which means lots of people can come together, not just the people of your group. You may have discussion with your group, but then to create broader, right? Bringing together broader, a broader conversation. These, I think, are all, you know, ways to begin. Are really ways in which the first difficult step, which is breaking the isolation. The moment you break the isolation, there is already an enrichment of our imagination. There is already an empowerment. I hate that word because it's so misused. But there's also more, right? And um, this is what the feminist movement did in its beginning with the process of consciousness raising, right? Where you come together and you begin to speak of your problem collectively. And then what we realized was a, a qualitative jump. It was the, the change from misery to an epistemology of suffering, turning suffering into a means of knowledge and a means of struggle. Not allowing suffering to destroy you internally but to turn it outside in a transformative force. This, I think, is what you have to uh, tap into. It's the force you have to tap into. Thank you very much. If we still have a few minutes, there is a question online. Okay. I'm not managing from here, so I don't know if Shiam, you can... Is many... Is... Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I okay, do. great. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was quite inspiring. I wanted to come back maybe again to the to the role that we have as architects and urban planners or designers, because I have the feeling we often speak about the comments from this activist perspectives and somehow being invited to being part of that community that is actually essential to, to create uh, the comments or to then um, take care of them. And then I wonder what is actually the architect's or urban planner's role, because we are not, an, often we are employed by some authority and we're not an inherent part of this community. And then maybe we are part of it in the beginning or we are asked to be. So, so I was wondering, how would you see this, this role of an architect who in, at some point can be part of this process of commoning, but is not uh, part of, of the community who is taking care of it all the time? Yeah, I know, my, you know, your, your problem is the problem of all of us, you know, whoever we are, we're working in some institution. I've been a teacher, I was in the university, you know, so my problem is, okay, so what do you tell students, right, who want to get a degree so they can get a job, so they can fit into the society, and, uh, and you're part of an institution who certainly is not, uh, you know, for revolution, right, so it's in a way, it's a struggle to be able to use their space and to use their knowledge, you know, at the same time to basically, so I would say to you, I would say to the community of architects, 
you know, are working within institutions, right? Bring in, into your work, into your spaces, the voices of the people who will live and suffer the consequences of what you build, right? What you build will affect people's lives. So you can already bring in into those spaces where you work, that stories. You can also, as I was mentioning before, learn about the implication of what you plan from the history of what architecture has done in the cities where you live. Look at that history. What have been the consequences of urban planning? What have they done to community, to people? I think once you do that, in the look at the past and look at the communities now, right? Then it's a political choice, of course, right? But you can begin that process, you know? You, I think that that I seems to me indispensable. And then you begin to see, you know, in the range of possibilities, how that is transforming your thinking. And then, of course, is a struggle with the institution. And then is a struggle to find the allies, because you alone will not be able to change institutional planning. But there may be allies in the communities that will be affected. So it's a multifaceted process that has a, a stretch into the past, a stretch into communities beyond the architectural world, and then, you know, in the sense of reconstructing an idea of what is possible today and, and what is desirable. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions uh, online, ah, yes, Mateus, Mateus, you have some questions, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, I have a very brief question. Uh, in terms of the creation of the commons in the urban environment and the idea of reclaiming that, I would like to uh, hear a bit more the, the intersections of that with movements of climate justice and how they are uh, connected. I can think about this because there is a danger, a, a kind of a, what comes to my mind is some examples in bed style, for example, in Brooklyn, where, as you mentioned, uh, urban gardens uh, uh, managed by African-American communities or Latino communities has, in places that are sensitive, environmentally speaking, uh, right now are actually starting unleashing this movement of gentrification in that community. So the real estate market kind of taking over in that space that was firstly taken by the commons and or kind of commoning sort of action. And uh, that used to be brownfield uh, or have their soil or be places that have uh, uh, flooding and now are this wave of the, the same community being pushed further away to the outskirts of the city. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's my, but that's my, pretty much my question, how we deal with this uh, counter effect of commoning, let's say. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a big, big struggle. And I think the question is always, you know, for people who move into community and want to, to basically connect with the, with the struggle, with the organization, with the needs, uh, you know, that of the community itself. I think that what's happening back time, you know, I live in New York, my God, and the situation in New York is really, is one of the worst in the world from this point of view. Because I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I understand, for instance, that uh, even real estate places now do not want less and less even want to sell places. Because uh, what is happening is you have companies who are trying to buy entire entire blocks 
and and uh, they they are and once these companies are buying entire blocks they can impose the rents that they want to so they they don't even want the individual the, the whole idea of the individual owner who has a little house all of that is out is not being encouraged instead renting is encouraged because that way they can make more profit by rent so new york is a very tough situation and i think the people are moving into an area right and they're speaking of you know the improvement and so on that would have to happen always you know in conjunction with people in the community otherwise you have this uh, you know the flowers in the desert right so that they become the oven post you know at the oven post of um, the new gentrification right Okay, hey, um, Silvia, I suppose that you are close maybe to uh, conclude because I see that uh, you're a little bit um, nervous. <laughs> and um, um, I would have liked uh, to uh, to bring some other topics to the discussion, but I think we will have to find a way to have maybe another occasion. I, maybe I, I can do another 10, 15 minutes, but uh, the, I have to... I do care work, and so I have uh, care work and duties. And um, if I need to have a five minutes break to to rearrange some of the, of um, yeah. Okay. To, to take care of that. Five minutes now. Yeah, five okay. minutes. Sure. Okay, I think that. Uh, and, and then I can, and then I can stay another another few okay. minutes. Okay, no problem. Sure. So we wait for you. Yes. Good. I you. you want a book to read? To share the game? Okay. Thank 
come back and we, we listen together uh, the statements of the other people. I have them organized in the program. It's only five minutes. Hello, 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 hello. Yes, we, we are Hi. here. <laughs> we okay. are. Yes, okay. So, you're back, Sylvia. Sí. Unable to start video, okay? No, I need okay. to start. Okay, I don't care. You don't have, to, you can hear my voice. You don't have to see me. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's not a problem. So, I see Elvira uh, has raised uh, her hand. So, I don't know, Elvira, you want to say something? Um, yes, uh, I, I would like to, to say many things, but I hope we will have other occasion. Uh, I just want to thank you and say you goodbye because I have to go. Uh, Dark has come and um, I have to, to go home now. Uh, but I, I, I hope that we will continue this dialogue. And I really would like also to listen to the reaction of Paula to, to what we have uh, speaking uh, on today. And so just thank you another time for, for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much uh, for, for your suggestions and, and uh, for being here with us. Um, so I, do, I see there are still some people here. Um, I don't know if someone wants to add. Yeah, or... I can do five, 10 minutes and then I have to go. Otherwise I would profit uh, just to introduce some some uh, questions that maybe we should find another moment to yeah. discuss. Um, well, in, in your, your book uh, on, uh, on, the, um, the, um, on the body, um, you, you are, you are uh, taking a, a position, a critical position towards uh, the way in which Foucault now describes the 
politics uh, of uh, the discipline uh, uh, and the, the, yeah, the transformation of the modern body. But from what I, I understand, uh, your positions are not really in opposition. You, you are not uh, uh, really so critical, in fact, in, uh, in this reading. I'm saying that because uh, I've just uh, concluded a book that the title is uh, The Biopolitical Garden, where, in fact, I, I question exactly what you were asking before, the fact that uh, with uh, our design activities, we work uh, very much on defining conditions inside yeah. which you know, can, uh, can, can take uh, uh, freedom on one side, we hope always this, but uh, also very much to be inside the uh, disciplines and uh, uh, protocols of security, securization uh, of space. And of course, I would like to, to discuss also this maybe more in detail in, uh, in another oh, occasion. But yeah. the, your relation yeah. with the Foucault <laughs> position, I would be very uh, good. Certainly in Foucault, there is a whole level in which uh, the, the question of the body is not connected. I mean, there's a whole area of the whole issue of the production. Foucault looks at the body in a very particular way, in a very limited way. They say, to me, the question of the body, for instance, there's very hardly a reference, you know, to women, to reproduction, uh, in, in, in Foucault's analysis. And this certainly, you know, was one of my criticism. Uh, I think also I have a difference because, uh, you know, Foucault has particularly in his conception of punishment, you know, that he distinguishes very sharply between two regimes of punishment, one in the Middle Ages, the seize the body as the center of, uh, of the punishment with the torture, with uh, the, the, you know, burning, etc. It actually doesn't talk about which hands. Um, and, and then a period in which you have the incarceration. So the body soul, the body soul split, right? The new form of, of punishment in capitalism uh, or, or the new forms of power are acting on the soul more than on the body. I reject completely that view uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, I don't accept the separation body and soul. So incarceration is a terrible, terrible, terrible attack on the body. Torture does not end. And incarceration itself is a torture. Incarceration itself is a torture of the body. And, and then, of course, torture does not end with incarceration. You know? and, and, uh, and moreover, you know, he speaks from a very you know, limited European perspective, because when you look at the United States, you know, for example, the, the regime the, the United States inflicted on the slave people, the, the 19th century, I mean, Beccaria may have worked for the Europeans, but it didn't work in the United States. In the United States, you know, into, into, into the 20th century, you had lynching. Lynching was, it was uh, you know, after World War II, there were many, many lynching. So the idea that somehow we have a regime and an execution, capital punishment. Capital punishment never stopped in the United States, on the contrary. So the idea, the, the, the separation, distinction, contradiction that he makes between these two regimes of power, I have, I have problems with that. And then, of course, you know, which body is, you know, Foucault is talking about? He's talking about a generalized, abstract body, whereas, uh, you know, I think there's a very different regime of of uh, of a relationship of capitalism to the body, whether it is women, whether it is men, whether it is you know intersex, that are of course forbidden. I I have learned tremendously the some of the latest Foucault you know works, particularly his analysis of how in Europe, and you know by the nineteenth century you have this. Uh, you know, legislation that forces a distinction between women and men, you know, that in fact, you know, prohibits the existence of the intersex. That I think has always been very important, right? This analysis of, uh, you know, the, the enforcement of hetero, of, of, of the binary. 
and uh, and identify identifying his historical moment, which is a very important historical moment. It's the historical moment of the formation of the nuclear family. It's the historical moment, you know, of of um, uh, basically the the whole attack on homosexuality, the definition of, of, of homosexuality as a as a as a you know psychological physical disease. So. You know, I, I, I've learned a lot from Foucault, and I think Foucault has been a, a milestone. On the other hand, these are some of the limits I've seen. Of course, of course. Thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, clarification. And maybe if, uh, again, uh, there are no other we can questions, I'll come back to what you were describing in the terms of uh, Rurban. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Because it is interesting the fact that you are reversing the way. Uh, in the 70s, there were some uh, French uh, geographers uh, speaking of uh, uh, the urban, the ur ur urbanization, but it was mainly uh, the urban arriving into the rural and ah. urbanizing the rural. And you use it in the opposite sense. No? So th yeah. that's uh, very interesting. And also, um, I think that we, we have to consider that the, uh, the contemporary urban space, or what you call urbanization, is, uh, is, is very different from uh, the, the, the traditional uh, city and is, is a space that is really hybrid, not where you have uh, pieces of agriculture, where you have forests, where you have, uh, uh, I mean, it's a territory, it's a city territory as it has been described since the, the 60s. And um, um, inside this uh, metropolitan space or urban and metropolitan space, there is uh, there has been a, a strong push towards concentration or concentration of everything, wealth, uh, jobs, uh, uh, possibilities uh, of, of emancipation. And we, we are, um, since many years working here, there are also some uh, student that have been uh, uh, working with their PhD thesis on, on this uh, aspect, on, on the possibility through a different uh, idea of, uh, uh, say, urban space, to touch to the question of the structure of relations that you have inside those spaces. So instead of imagining all, always this hierarchical type of space that you were also mentioning in terms of modernity now becoming so hierarchical and defining top and, and low, um, to move towards a more horizontal type of space, horizontal in terms of horizontal relations, more parathetic, more balanced, uh, and so on. And uh, we, we are convinced that uh, the design of, of space can really bring a contribution to this idea of horizontality. Uh, I think that on this uh, ground, we, we, we could exchange with you, my starting will uh, really from this point. Can we dismantle the hierarchical um, space we have constructed at the scale of the city, at the scale of a territory, in the terms of relations between territories, between uh, cities? And how can the design of space contribute to dismantle this uh, idea of order, no? that is an idea of order always based on uh, the terms of hierarchy? Yeah, I think this will be for another discussion. But all okay. I can say now is that, yes, this is uh, this, I think that the imagination how to rethink space is there. What is not there are the power relations that are able to enforce it. During the break, by the way, I heard, I don't know if it is true, that a bomb was was launched on a hospital and 500 people have been killed in a hospital in Palestine. 500 people have been killed in a hospital. Um, I, yeah, but uh, this, this is a news that I just heard during the break. Um, but I don't know if it is true. I have to check, check more radio information but the, what you're saying i think uh, i think the imagination is there the question is how do we build the political movements yeah. that are able to regain that control over territorial and 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 uh, relation over the territory because right now this is our problem I think there's a lot of imagination. What we are missing 
is is the capacity to enforce it. Yeah. Okay, Silvia, um, we want to thank you again, and uh, uh, also for the generosity of your time of remaining with us uh, until now. And uh, I really hope that we might continue, as you said uh, at the beginning, not to... I'm very interested in doing that. I'm very interested also in learning from you. I'm very interested in learning. So, yes, I look forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks also to all the people that were uh, online and also thanks to the students that were here. And um, you have given, I think, a lot of uh, food for thought for the next uh, days and weeks and months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to you and the best to you all. <laughs> thank you. So I hope that you like this conversation. <laughs>